Last time we spoke about Paticca Samupada, dependent origination, in eight conditions or with eight conditions or in eight stages. Today we'll discuss it in a slightly more detailed way with eleven conditions or stages. If we understand the eight-stage version of Bhaticcha Samupada, that's sufficient for our, our practical needs. This was the way the Buddha recited it to him, recited to himself alone in the forest. The eleven-stage version, however, will give us a little help here and there and provide us with a more complete theoretical understanding. And so we'll take a look at it also. We can compare the difference to, it's like when we can use a car or drive a car. All we really need to know is how to work the various things on the car in order to drive it safely. It's not necessary for the ordinary person to know exactly how the car was made and where everything came from and it's the details of its design. The ordinary person only needs to know how to drive it safe, safely. It's the same with the eight-stage version of Paticca Samupada. It's enough for the ordinary person to to understand this and then be able to apply it to our ordinary lives, then we'll be able to receive tremendous benefits. However, if we can understand the 11 stage version, our knowledge will be more complete. It's like with a car, knowing how it was designed, how it was built, and where everything came from. All of you know that it's relatively simple to learn how to drive a car properly, but that it's really quite difficult and takes a lot of work to learn all the details about the car, its design, how it was made, and so on. And it's the same with Paticca Samupada. The eight-stage version is rather simple to understand. It doesn't take that much effort to observe and understand this. However, the long version, the complete version, is much more difficult to understand because it involves certain very, very subtle and hard to, hard to observe things. So, for our practical purposes, the eight-stage version is sufficient. The longer version involves certain things which are quite difficult to understand, and so it takes a lot more work, a lot more careful observation to understand the longer version. It would be an, it's enough to understand the shorter one. In fact, these days, the longer version, one example of how difficult to understand it is, is the very confused ways it's being taught these days. Now, Bhatichya Samupada is being explained in many ways, some of which are quite humorous, and others which are just out of line with the Buddha's intention and the meaning <coughs> intended by the Buddha. As for the eye, makes contact with a visible form, and then eye consciousness arises. Together these make patsa, contact. Then from contact arises feeling, vetana. From feeling arises dhanha, craving. From craving, 
upadana, attachment, from attachment, bhava, existence, and from existence, chati, birth, and from birth, all the forms of dukkha. This one is quite simple because who amongst us doesn't know the eyes? Every one of us can see and experience our eyes constantly. And the same with the ears, nose, tongue, body, and so on. So this is really quite simple and open to everybody's investigation in order to use that understanding to quench suffering. But then when some of us begin to wonder, well, where do the sense organs and the sense objects come from? Then it starts to get more difficult. If we look into it, the sense organs and sense objects come from mind-body, nama-rupa. And then where does this come from? Mind-body comes from vijnana, sense consciousness. And then vijnana, where does that come from? It comes from sankhara, the power of concocting, the power of concocting. And that comes from avicca, ignorance. This is much more difficult to observe and understand. But those who really want to understand things will start to look into this. It begins with the, the element of ignorance that exists everywhere. And then from that, that gives rise to the power of concocting. And from this power of concocting, of, of formation, there arises sense consciousness, vijnana. And then from vijnana there comes mind-body. And then from mind-body the sense organs and so on. So the inner sense organs and the outer sense objects come from mind-body, nama-rupa. This is like with, with our car. The, or this, and this is the practical starting point. This is the starting point for our practice of Paticca Samupada, the sense organs, the sense objects. But if we want to look where these come from, it's like with a car. For the car to function, you need a complete car. Especially you need the motor to provide the power, and you need the chassis in body of the car. This is very similar to our situation. For the senses to be functioning, we need a complete living organism. The mind is like the motor of the car. The body is like the body and chassis, the structure, the framework of the car. This is where the sense organs and sense objects come from. If we ask, well, where does this whole car, where does the entire car come from? We would look especially and say that it comes from having a motor. It's pointless to go and make a car if you don't have a motor first. The engine is what's crucial in our car or vehicle. So very sim in a similar way, when we talk about this whole mind-body process or this life, if we look is where does that come from, we'd especially focus on consciousness. It's necessary to have consciousness first, that there be basic consciousness for there to be a living organism. Then if we ask, well then where does this Vijnana, this consciousness, come from. It's like with the engine of the car. 
we, it comes from a very subtle, detailed manufacturing process. So with vijnana, it comes from a very subtle, detailed, very difficult to observe process of fabrication, manufacturing, of taking various, this activity of putting things together to get something new, in this case, consciousness. Often making things is a very crude process, but here it's incredibly subtle because the product is consciousness. So we say that consciousness comes from a very subtle process or activity of, of concocting or sankara, which means to put together, to fabricate, to concoct. Then if we ask, well, where does this sankara come from? With, with our car, this, this activity of concocting, where does that come from in making the car? Now, it depends with the car. The, we, may, we may be making it with understanding that is that the car is truly necessary or we may be making it with the foolishness with foolishness in, and the car isn't necessary and then we just make end up making something which is a problem for us and which causes lots of hassles with the car this may not be clear whether it's it's necessary or not but in the case of our own minds, it becomes much clearer. This power of concocting that leads to consciousness, the sense organs, attachment, ego, and suffering, this clearly comes from ignorance, from a lack of knowledge, or from, our, from stupidity that thinks we have to go and do this, we have to go and make something though in fact it's not really necessary. When the mind acts in a, need, in a way that is necessary, that's a whole different matter. But when this power of concocting comes from ignorance, thinking that we need to do this when we really don't, then the result will be dukkha. We just go and make more, more pain and misery for ourselves. So this power of concocting comes from ignorance of, of not knowing what really should be done, not really knowing what to do, and thinking that it's good to make dukkha for ourselves, thinking it's, it's somehow beneficial to, to create troubles and hassles. And so from this ignorance comes the power of concocting, then arises sense consciousness, arises mind-body, the sense organs, contact, and so on to ego birth and suffering. Long, long ago, the people in the forests and in the mountains, they didn't, they didn't have cars and they didn't need them. And so they were free of all the problems that we have now because we have cars. We, we decided, or our not long ago people decided we needed cars, and so we started making them. But this was clearly, this was ignorant because you can see all the problems that have come with having cars, all the pollution, all the junk, all the accidents, the many people who have died because of cars. They weren't necessary. In the past, people could be happy without them. But then from our own ignorance, we, we created them. And then now we have all the hassles and problems that come with them. So now it's necessary that we become very clever and intelligent in managing this, this problem of cars. We have to deal with the cars very intelligently so that they won't be problems. We have to 
we have to control or regulate this flow of dependent origination so that the cars don't create more problems for us. Although the, the original impulse for the car was ignorant, we can bring in intelligence and govern and manage the whole thing so that it won't be of, it won't be of trouble for us. So in order to control this flow of dependent origination, we need another cycle of it. We need a whole other cycle that instead of being the cycle of ignorance, will be the cycle of, of understanding or of knowledge. Ignorance is avicca. There's a whole other cycle which is the cycle of vicha, which is in, intuitive understanding. The Buddha, in fact, discussed this directly, but nobody has shown much interested, interest in it. However, we ought to be interested in it so that we know how to control the ignorance cycle of dependent origination. So please get ready to listen very carefully because we're pretty sure you've, you've never heard this before. This is never discussed even in Thailand. In Burma and Sri Lanka, they, they never talk about it. So we're pretty certain that none of you have heard of this before. But there's a whole another cycle, also of 11 conditions, that is the, of dependent origination. When the ignorance cycle has reached its completion in suffering, when suffering is complete, this leads to something new, or it can lead to something new. And that's when the, the suffering forces the, one who's, the person who's suffering to look for, to search for an individual or some knowledge or some methodology or something that will free free us from suffering. So suffering itself will, will start to push us to look for a way out from suffering. And this leads to the belief, to, to confidence that there is somewhere knowledge or a method or something that will get us out of suffering. And so we say that dukkha is the basis for sata, sata, confidence or, or faith, faith that we can find a way out from, from dukkha. In short, we have faith or confidence that there is something that can help us with dukkha. In short, we can just say this is faith in Dhamma. Dhamma is the, the system that will f help, help us get free of suffering. And then we have faith in this. Once this faith arises, then after it there arises what we call pamocha, pamocha, or delight. It's like if you find a, a valuable jewel lying on the ground or someplace. You'll be delighted at this, at this discovery. And so from when faith first arises, it's followed by delight. This pamocha is similar to the appetite we were talking about earlier. This appetite that we're delighted to to make use of or to to do what we whatever has to be done so this appetite for for practice for for our study this is what is meant by pamocha it's like when we're in danger and then we're offered something that can provide us with safety that can help us 
then we're of course very delighted to to make use of that safety. And so from sata, confidence or faith, there arises this delight to to practice, to study, to do what we have to do in order to, as we see that there's a way offered to us, we begin to become, to have an appetite to follow it. We need to have a much stronger appetite for practicing Dhamma than the kind of appetite we need to eat food. From this this appetite arises PT and I'm which can often be translated satisfaction. So following the appetite towards towards practice, towards Dhamma, there arises PT, which is a satisfaction that we've that we have this opportunity, a satisfaction that this is possible. And so a sense of satisfaction or contentment. Sometimes when this is very excited and strong, we call it rapture. When it's more subtle <clears throat> and refined, we call it satisfaction or contentment. Now we're speaking about the flow of dependent origination that leads to perfect awakening. And so we're talking about mental things. And we're, we'll also we'll be talking about things which become more and more subtle as we go along. So after PT, the satisfaction, once we have the appetite and are beginning to, to practice, there starts to come satisfaction with what we're doing because we start to see that it brings results. And so then there's a satisfaction that something valuable is, is coming from, from what we're doing. Out of this, then from PT or satisfaction is patsati, calmness or tranquility, patsati. When from the satisfaction, when we start to realize that there's, there, this brings results, then we can, we start to calm down. Our worries and anxieties start to calm down. Our bodies can relax and our minds can calm down. Patsati is this calmness that follows from satisfaction. Then from Patsati, there arises Sukha or joy. But here, this is a special joy. The meaning here is, is very particular. It means the joy of Dhamma, the joy that comes from Dhamma. We're not talking about ordinary happiness that can come from eating food or from other sensual activities and things like that. We're talking specifically about the joy that comes from Dhamma practice, from real Dhamma practice. This is something that is absolutely necessary. When, and this joy of Dhamma comes from Hatsati, it comes from calmness. Our ordinary kinds of happiness come from excitement, from stimulation, but the joy of Dhamma is a calm joy. It comes from calmness. And so when the body and the mind calms down, there arises a Dhamma kind of joy, which we call Sukha. This is absolutely necessary, but it will happen naturally if we practice correctly. Now this joy is absolutely necessary for a calm, clear, stable mind, or what we call samati. Samati is when the mind is totally gathered together, is very pure, stable, and alert. The Buddhists said that, that joy, 
this joy of peacefulness is crucial for samadhi, for this stable, clear mind. So, in a way, this joy is samadhi. But in this case, we're pointing out how the joy is a necessary factor. There are some other factors too, but the joy is crucial. And so the Buddha said that joy causes samadhi. Then the Buddha said samadhi leads to yata bhuta yana tatsana, <laughs> yata bhuta, which means when the mind is really stable, clear, and alert, when the mind is samadhi, it sees things correctly as they really are. Yata bhuta yana tatsana, yana tatsana, means to see things, to view things correctly according to their reality, to see the reality of things. This arises naturally when the mind is samadhi, when it's properly stable and focused. Then when we see things correctly as they really are, the Buddha said this gives rise to nipita, yada, yata putta, jnana datsana, gives rise to nipita, which means disenchantment. When we see things as they really are, we become disenchanted with them. They lose the, the magical quality that our ignorance tries to put into things. So when we see them as they really are, le this leads to disenchantment. Then this disenchantment leads to viraka, viraka, or fading away. This is, once we become disenchanted with things, then this leads to the fading away of our attachment in things. Once we lose this enchantment, when there is disenchantment, the attachment to things fades away, it dissolves, it breaks up and dissolves. So, nipita leads to viraka. This word has very special meaning. Viraka leads to vimuti. This fading away of attachment leads to emancipation. The mind is liberated from these things when attach attachment to things dissolves and fades away. Then the mind is liberated from things. The mind escapes and is emancipated. And then vimuti, emancipation, leads to kaya jnana, kaya jnana, which means knowledge of ending, knowledge of ending. This is when we, we know very deeply and profoundly that our problems have ended, that all dukkha, all suffering has ended. So once there is emancipation, there can arise the knowledge that all our problems are finished, which is called kaya jnana. And then this kaya jnana leads to nipan or nibbana, perfect coolness. When there's the knowledge that all problems, all dukkha has ended, then the mind experiences or tastes the coolness of nibbana. So we'll review this again. Dukkha, suffering, leads to faith or confidence that we can end suffering, that we can quench dukkha. Then this faith or confidence leads to pamocha, or the delight in searching, in practice, for the Dhamma in practicing Dhamma. This Dhamma delight leads to piti or satisfaction in 
in practicing, yeah, in one becomes practice. satisfied more and more with, mm-hmm. with Dhamma, with this wonderful jewel that we begin to discover. Piti leads to Patsati, the calmness when all the things that disturb our bodies and minds, all the things that are causing confusion and chaos, these calm down. You can call it mm. quenching of agitation or calming yeah. of agitation. Yeah, well, but this calming leads to the kind of joy which is pure and clean. And then this Dhamma joy leads to samati, the mind that is perfectly stable. Let us let us specify especially that samati here, or in Buddhism means the mind that is clean, it's, it's free of defilements, it's stable, nothing can shake it, and it's active, it's perfectly alert. And then samati leads to yata bhuta jnana datsana, which is seeing things correctly as they really are. And then the seeing things as they really are leads to nipita, which where we we lessen our infatuation with things. We we the illusion that things are positive and negative starts to we start to lose that illusion and infatuation. And then nipita leads to viraka the fading away and dissolving of our attachment to things. And viraka leads to vimuti, that we can be liberated from, from everything, that the emancipation from these things that no longer deceive us. And liberation, emancipation leads to kayatnana, the knowledge that problems are over, we have, there's no more suffering, there's no more trouble. And kayatnana leads to the experience of Nibbana. So this is another, a whole other cycle of dependent origination. It has 11 stages, just like the ignorance cycle. But this, this is this, these stages of one condition leading to the next, leading to the next. This, this cycle or process of 11 conditions is the one that will destroy the ignorance cycle, the cycle of understanding, of wisdom, will replace or destroy the ignorance cycle that leads to, to dukkha. Now, it's a fact of life that you have to get to know the first one first. You have to get to know the... You'll have to go through this cycle of the ignorant dependent origination many, many times. Not until you finally realize how that works. Only then can you really begin to see the, the liberation the dependent origination of liberation and peace. First, we must realize the, our problem, must see the ignorance cycle. But once we see how that works, then the liberative cycle of, of wisdom can begin to become apparent. We can begin to realize that. One absolute truth is that you must practice anapanasati if you will have the second cycle of paticca samupada. So you ought to have an appetite for, you ought to be delighted that you can practice and be satisfied with the practice of anapanasati in order that you can develop this second liberating cycle of dependent origination. And for the time that remains today, we'll speak about anapanasati itself. Anapanasati is a science wherein we 
we learn to use the breath to the furthest of its potentials. We make the most use of the breath that is possible. Nature all by itself knows how to use the breathing to solve problems, to, to remove suffering. For example, if, if we have hiccups, it's possible our bodies naturally know to breathe deeply, to cure that. And there are other ways where the, the breath, or I'm sorry, hiccups, is a way for the body to deal with something. Or when we yawn, it's another response, a natural response of the body, using the breath to, to deal with some imbalance or something that's incorrect with the body. This is our examples of how nature knows how to use the breathing to solve problems. I think it means something like, in Thai they say ton hai jaya, which means something like to take a deep breath. Sometimes, it just naturally, you just take a deep breath and it, one feels much better. One, it will relax some unpleasant feeling or emotion. There are some other examples which I can't quite translate right now, so I'll figure it out later, um, which show us how nature knows how to use the breathing to deal with problems in the body or even mental ones, where by breathing in a certain way, it brings calmness and peace to, to life. And Though the people who used to live in the forest to live, to live rather wild, primitive lives, they knew how to use the breathing to bring peace of mind to themselves or to summon their, their mental energy. In some old texts, it tells how some of the giants and demons who lived in the forest when, when fighting, if they were shot by an arrow, they had a special way of breathing to drive away the pain so they could get up and start fighting again. There was, they could like summon the prana which was in the, which was in the air and use it to, use this life force to drive away the pain. So even people who were using, would use the breathing for such worldly or even foul and evil pursuits. This, even this was possible. The various so-called giants and demons living in the forests and mountains. Then over time, this knowledge about the breathing was, was developed and different people contributed more knowledge to it and it, it developed into a science, just kind of naturally. Until the time of the Buddha, there is widespread knowledge of how to use the breathing to solve various physical problems and also to, for doing certain things to clear up and clean up the mind. There's even a story how the young Prince Siddhartha, when he was only something like seven or eight years old, was at his father was having an important plowing ceremony and he was left alone under a tree. And he started practicing anapanasati. This young boy at that time knew how to practice anapanasati. Now we don't believe that this, he learned this in some previous life. It seems to us that the, the knowledge of anapanasati must have been widespread at that time, so even a young boy knew how to practice it. And then there was a, a custom or a tradition for the young men in India that when they, before, when they were young men, before becoming, reaching full adulthood, they should spend some time trying to develop what's called itirit or magic powers. They should 
find some special aids to to help them in life before they became adults and assumed their their adult duties in life. So they would spend some time doing this and they would use the breathing, they would use anapanasati to develop certain special mental abilities that were beyond what an ordinary person had. They would use the breathing for this. Now this might not be the real miracle of, of ending suffering, but they were using anapanasati even in these other ways, although not in the, the, the most important way. Even when, when I was a child, there were many, many young boys who went to this one teacher who supposedly could teach magic powers and they practiced anapanasati for the sake of magic powers and the result that many of them went crazy. The reason was either the teacher didn't know what he was doing or that these, these young boys, these boys, these teenage young men, <laughs> these young men had too much desire, there was too much defilement in what they were doing. And so, instead of getting what they were after, they just, it really messed up their minds and some of them even went crazy. So, we're not interested then in the kind of anapanasati or mindfulness with breathing that is practiced for magic powers. We just want to practice mindfulness with breathing in order to quench dukkha, to free ourselves from suffering. But if any of you really like the word magic powers or itiri, then you can use it. But use it in terms of the ability to destroy the defilements. Use the words magic powers to mean getting rid of suffering, because that is the, the biggest miracle there is in life. In Anapanasati there are four areas or main stages of practice. In the first area we deal with the breathing and we we study the breathing until we find the best the best kind of breathing. The breathing that is healthiest and most peaceful that is best then we study and see that this breathing can be used to regulate, to control the body. So we learn to use this best kind of breathing to put the body in a condition that is most useful for us. So in this first stage of, of anapanasati, we, we discover, we look for and until we discover the best kind of breathing and then use, use that to regulate, to maintain the body in this condition or state that we need. One example of how the breathing can be, can regulate the body is if you have a wound that is bleeding. It's possible to breathe in a very refined, very slow, refined way, <clears throat> so that the, the blood will flow much more slowly and you'll lose much less blood. You can study this for yourself. Go and take very long, deep breaths. Take short breaths. Study these, the very long breaths, the short breaths. Take very coarse breaths, very refined breaths, and you'll see for yourself how this works. You'll see that when there's coarse, rough breathing, that it makes our whole body, it disturbs the whole body, and the blood flows in a, a whole different way than when we take long, deep, peaceful breaths. So by studying your own breathing, you can learn how this works. And we can find the kind of breathing the best kind of breathing that will put, that will calm down everything in the body. And then when everything is very calm, the mind will develop samadhi naturally. 
We don't have to be greedy or desirous of samadhi, just find the best kind of breathing and use that to calm the body. Keep calming the body and samadhi will develop by itself. So you must, you must observe and examine the breathing very carefully. Must be able to discriminate very subtly, not by thinking, but just by observing. Have a very subtle sensitivity to the differences between long breathing, short breathing, coarse breathing, refined breathing, until you can control the breathing, until you can regulate it in order to make the body perfectly calm. Then you'll find the kind of breathing where with just one breath you can drive away any, any dukkha, any misery that's in the mind. When we really have mastered the breathing like this, if any suffering comes into the mind, we can just sweep it away with one breath. Any kind of annoyance, anything that's annoying or bothering us, we can just get rid of it in one breath if we really know the breathing. So if we can breathe in this way, this is, you could call this sacred breathing, to be able to breathe in this way. So this is the first stage of this practice, is having influence over the breathing, and through the breathing, being able to influence. We could even say having power over the breathing so that we can have power over the body. In the second stage, we practice in order to have power over the feelings. In the first stage, it's power over the body. In the second stage, it's power over the vetana, the feelings. There are many different kinds of feelings, lots of different variations within feelings. But in short, they can be described as positive feelings and negative feelings. The positive feelings are particularly dangerous because they can really delude us and confuse us and lead us astray. The positive feelings have a lot of power over our minds and we generally, very willingly, become their slaves, enslave ourselves to the positive feelings. When we can study them to the point that we can control the feelings using the breathing, then we're able to calm these positive feelings so that they're not a disturbing, deluding kind of positiveness, but to calm them so there's just a cool and calm joy the kind of Dhamma joy we spoke of earlier, then we have power over the feelings. If we observe, we'll see that the feelings stir up or condition, concoct all kinds of thoughts and concepts. When there's a feeling, it will bring up a con it will condition a concept. When we don't have any control over this, the concepts that are concocted will be all kinds of crazy and disturbing things. The mind will be thinking all over the place, often in harmful ways, if not harmful, at least useless or, or wasteful. But when we know how to control the feelings, then we can con control this concocting of the mind so that whatever concepts and thoughts do arise, there'll be peaceful ones. There won't be any more crazy thoughts of the harmful kind that confuse us and cause us suffering. So we can learn to control the feelings so that the feelings no longer concoct and condition our minds in all kinds of crazy and harmful ways. When we can control the feelings, we won't be deluded by, by food, by flesh mm -hmm. and by fame. Mm -hmm. This is very important nowadays because our world is full of things that are exciting and enticing and stimulating. There are all kinds of luxuries to, to beckon us. And so we need to be able to control the feelings 
in order to avoid being deluded in it by and infatuated with food, flesh, and fame. To put it most briefly, to not be deluded by any positiveness in the world. And think <clears throat> how, how safe will we be then when we can control the feelings, when we can control all this positiveness. Think how safe we will be that nothing will be able to touch us. And then, in the third stage, we learn to regulate or master the mind. After we've mastered the body and the feelings, then there's the mind. The mind is what is central. It leads in everything. And so we need to be able to master the mind. We must train the mind. We must study it practice with it, develop it, stretch it, exercise it, adjust it, improve it, whatever you want to call it. We train it and work with it and practice it until the mind has been, has been mastered so that the mind no longer causes any, any problems. We can train the mind until that it can be, it can be delighted. It can, be, it can have a very safe delight or joy whenever we want. We can train it to be very stable so that it has, so that it becomes perfectly focused and has samati whenever we need. Or we can train it to let go, to be free, to train the mind to be free of, of anything so it doesn't grab on to anything. We can train the mind in these ways so that we have so that the mind has been mastered. Now, we're not saying that you have to do this all in 10 days. You, you can <laughs> probably understand that it, it probably can't all be done in 10 days. But you should know about this so that, after, so that you can continue practicing this. And if you keep working on it for the rest of your life, you'll be able to do all these things. This isn't something to accomplish in just one or two weeks. It's something to master the mind. Is something to work on for the rest of our the rest of our lives. In the last area or stage of this practice, we learn to master our own ignorance. We learn to get rid of our our own stupidity. Unfortunately, all of us have quite a bit of ignorance and stupidity. So what we must do is correct this and replace the stupidity with, with wisdom. All of us have a tendency to see impermanent things as permanent. All these things that are impermanent, we see them as permanent and lasting. We see things that are, are, are prone to dukkha, that have the quality of dukkha. We see them as being happy and wonderful and beautiful. And we see things that are not self as being self, as being I and mine. So we need to correct this ignorance in order to see things as they really are, to replace our stupidity with, with wisdom. In Thai, there's a short phrase to, to see a sawtooth disc, discus, as a lotus. In, in Thailand, they have lots of lotuses, the beautiful flowers which have the curved edges. There's also an ancient weapon, a kind of discus with very sharp blades, which can be thrown, and it spins, and it's very dangerous. <coughs> they have a similar, in general, they have a similar shape. So this is a metaphor for ignorance, to see this very dangerous, deadly weapon as a beautiful, fragrant lotus. Then when we, when understanding replaces ignorance by seeing things as they really are, then this wicha or insight knowledge, this correct knowledge, leads to wiraka, and then our attachment to things fades away. The 
taking things to be I and mine dissolves and then attachment ceases and when attachment ceases or quenches then dukkha quenches which we call nirota and then the mind is free the mind is free and, and knows it's free and it's free in a way that will, la- will never never go away it's not a temporary freedom it's total freedom this is the fourth stage of anapanasati to to master and triumph over all ignorance and with it suffering the first stage is to master the body second stage is to master the feelings the third stage masters the mind and the fourth stage of anapanasati masters ignorance our own ignorance you can figure out for yourselves that all four of these stages will not be a, you won't be able to practice them in just 10 days but you can learn about it understand the basic theory and principles of practice you can work on it until you develop some facility with this practice so that you'll be able to continue until you're completely successful even if it takes your whole life then eventually you'll have the right kind of magic power the magic powers that are safe the kind of magic power that can can get rid of can destroy any problem that might arise for you we'll take a, a, a little look at this this magic power that we'll have at our fingertips when we've developed this enough then we will have all the mindfulness we need mindfulness will be subtle it will be quick it will always be there when it's needed there will be wisdom or understanding which is complete there'll be a thorough understanding of things as they really are we call this panya mindfulness is sati Hanya is this understanding, thorough understanding of things as they are. Then there will be Sampachanya, which is the ability to understand specifically each thing that appears in our life. Everything that happens will have the ability to understand it, to understand its basic nature and know what to do about it. And then there will be Samati, the mind that is clear clean calm and active this mind there will be plenty of will provide plenty of mental strength and energy so having these four things mindfulness understanding the specific understanding or applied wisdom about things and then the mind that has samati which has all the strength and energy it needs this is the the right kind of magic power these powers will enable us to deal with any problem that arises in our lives there must be sati or mindfulness which is very quick so that it's always on time on time means every time some object comes into consciousness whether it's a visual object or by the ear the nose or whatever whenever an object makes contact with the mind there is sati right there in order to stop the flow of dependent origination to stop the possibility of suffering then wisdom means or panya means the wisdom that we need wisdom is the knowledge and understanding that is necessary the things we ought to know or must know there's a lot of other things that aren't relevant or important if we go and learn all these things it might just it'll just fill our head and maybe make us crazy wisdom is just the necessary knowledge of how things really are if we have this correct wisdom then this will enable us to stop the flow of dependent origination 
Sampachanya is the wisdom that is appropriate for the specific duty of the moment. Whatever is happening right now, there's a duty, there's something that needs to be done. And Sampachanya is the understanding, the clear awareness of what to do and how to do it, how to respond. It's like all of us, most of us at home have medicine chests where we have all kinds of medicines. Now when we're sick, we don't go and just take the whole thing at once. We choose the correct medicine or cure for whatever our problem is, for whatever our ailment is. Sampacha is the same thing. For whatever specific thing is happening, we choose the right aspect of wisdom to deal with this this situation, to perform this duty. This is called sampachanya. And sati, mindfulness, has the, the responsibility to bring wisdom quickly, right on time, where it's needed, the right wisdom in the right place at the right time. That means immediately. So wisdom and panya in sampachanya, wisdom in action, must work together with sati. And fourth is samati, which is the power or strength of mind, or we can call it weight of mind. When wisdom is like sharpness, to cut something you need both sharpness and weight. If you just have some, a sharp blade, if you try and cut a tree with a razor blade, it won't work because there's only sharpness. You also need <coughs> weight. But if you combine sharpness with weight, you can do the work that needs to be done. So wisdom alone is not enough. There also has to be the strength or weight of samati. <coughs> when, when the samati is backing up the wisdom, then it will perform the function that we need. So, for example, to show how these work together as a team, if some, some harmful mood or something comes into the mind, or some harmful thing appears, mindfulness is there instantly, not a second too late. Mindfulness is there and <clears throat> immediately goes to the wisdom that has been developed and then chooses the right wisdom and then brings it as Sampachanya, the specific applied wisdom for this situation. And then that wisdom sees things as they are and knows what to do. And if, there's, if the Sampachanya, this applied specific wisdom, doesn't have enough strength, there's samat, Samati to give it all the strength and power it needs. And so the four work together like this in order to deal with any situation, especially with all problems. And never forget that it takes all four of these working together as a team. You, if any are missing, it just won't work and will suffer. But if we have all of them together functioning as a solid team, then we'll be able to deal with anything. If we have these four together, we can call it a holy treasure or a magical treasure or a special treasure. It's a treasure chest of the most important things we need in life. And we can... If you have these four things, these four dhammas, then you'll be able to master, you'll be able to control the flow of dependent origination that leads to dukkha. You'll be able to control it so that it doesn't arise. And simultaneously, you'll be able to control the other dependent origination that leads to perfect awakening. You can control that so that it, you can master that so that it, it does arise with mindfulness, understanding, wisdom in specific action and samati, the stable, clear, alert mind. If you have these four working for you, 
then you can master dependent origination so that the suffering aspect doesn't arise and that the awakening aspect does arise. You can have these four holy treasures when you practice mindfulness with breathing successfully and completely. Once you can practice this meditation successfully, then you will have these four excellent dhammas. If you do finish this practice, if you complete it successfully, and you don't have these four things, then you can come and yell and scream and punch us in the face if you want. But wait until you've finished it before you make any rash, rash decisions. But if you can really practice this and successfully, completely, then you will have these four most wonderful Dhamma treasures. If this first ten days isn't enough for you to understand all of these things and how to practice, then, then you should have another ten days, and if necessary, another, a fourth, a fifth, ten days, until you understand these things sufficiently to be able to put it in practice and succeed in your practice. So, a special thanks today for being good listeners. And so we'll finish today's talk and end for today. <laughs>